Perfect. So I'm going to wait a minute while people shuffle in, but thank you all for coming and joining us. Um, my name's Akash Karpasari, and I'm the president of the 66 College Council. My name is Ria Mehta, and I'm the vice president of the 66 College Council. As we let everyone join the Zoom call, we wanted to let you all know that we're here to support you and we hear your questions. We're working to ensure that the many questions you have for the fall semester will be answered through this town hall. And we will continue messaging through email and our online pages throughout the semester as we get accustomed to return to campus. So also feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask questions during the webinar. We have admin on call ready to answer questions through that as well and not just what we ask. The questions that we'll be asking have been informed by going through each question submitted via Instagram, personal messaging, and Zoom registration. Um, we know that every single question by no means will be addressed today, but we have done our best to compile a list of the most pressing questions. So we will now turn it over to Anku Galai, Vice President and Dean of Campus Life for her opening remarks. And we want to thank all of the administrators present for all the work they've been putting in for the fall semester. Good evening. Thank you for hosting this, Rhea and Akash. It's uh, good to see you. And although I love Zoom, I'm looking forward to seeing you more in person this semester. So welcome back, uh, Akash. I know you said you moved in yesterday, and I, I hope I hope all is well with your room move in. I wanted to welcome everybody to the call. It is uh, important for us to gather and just share information together. I know you've received so many emails over, over the summer. And what we thought with this session anyway is that we give, it, give you an opportunity and give us an opportunity to talk more directly and get into the bits of the questions that you need more information and detail on. Again, my name is Inku Galai. I am Senior Vice President and Dean of Campus Life. Um, I work with so many of the people that you will, you will hear on this call tonight. Um, and one of the really important goals for me and for the group that's on the call today, including the student planners, is that you see the faces of the people and hear from us directly, the folks who have really been planning and thinking about the semester ahead for you. Yesterday was one of the big move-in days, and it was elating on so many levels, even though the rain was pouring down half of, half, to, half of the day. It was the first time in a very long time we were able to be back together on campus. And that's our hope and wish and aspiration for all of us as we move forward, that we will come back um, and move forward with an off-campus, on-campus and off-campus experience together that will not look like any other semester, but will get us closer to what we all want, which is to have a full Emory experience. Um, I, I think one of the most important things I want to say tonight, and will come up again and again in the conversations we'll have tonight as a group, is how important it is that we do this together. As many faces as you'll see on the screen, you know, the administrators that have been uh, thinking about and planning your return, I want you to know that the semester ahead can only be, be successful if you're fully invested in your experience as well. Well, we're going to have to do this together like we've done every semester. So the information we're going to share tonight is going to be especially critical as you prepare to come back um, please listen with an open heart and open mind and know that we are doing the best that we can to make sure you have the experience that you want to have at Emory. I'm looking forward to the conversation and more than anything, um, especially for the new students and the students who haven't been on campus yet, I'm looking forward to seeing your faces and hearing from you and growing together as we move ahead this semester. I am going to turn it over to one of my best colleagues, uh, Dean Michael Elliott. Thank you, Dean Galai. Uh, I'm Michael Elliott. For those of you who don't know me, I am the Dean of Emory College of Arts and Sciences. I'm also a faculty member and have been at Emory now for over 20 years. And like uh, Dean Galai said, um, the semester that we're preparing for will be unlike any of those other many semesters that I've been on this campus. And I wanna thank Akash and Rhea, who are already uh, playing a critical role, critical roles as student leaders 
helping us um, stage this forum and cultivating the questions so that we can do our best and giving you the information you need to prepare for the semester. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk for a few minutes at a very high level really about some of the academic pieces of what you can expect for the fall semester. Um, and, you know, I think there are three key things, you know, about the last 18 months. One is that we've learned a lot about COVID, uh, the virus, so much more than when we were last on campus. We've learned a lot about um, how to work together, uh, as Enku said, uh, work together as a community in order to be compassionate with one another, in order to understand each other's needs. Um, and then we've also learned, unfortunately, uh, how we need to keep changing our expectations. Uh, you know, I think earlier this summer, uh, we were hoping for a different semester in terms of the prevalence of COVID uh, in, um, in the world, in Georgia, in Atlanta. And so we've had to react and we will continue to do that. We are committed to being a residential living, learning community. Um, and we are so excited to be with you again on campus and to have as many students as possible in our classrooms. We've put in place a set of measures that we, we have every bit of evidence and Amir St. Clair will talk more about this, believe can keep our community safe. Um, and yet we may have to make some changes as we go along the way uh, because the nature of the virus and what we learn about the virus may force us to make some changes. That doesn't necessarily mean we're planning to depopulate the campus again, there are many other steps that we can take to keep the community safe if it becomes necessary before such a dramatic action. We want our students on campus. Um, in the fall, being on campus will mean, and especially in the classrooms and labs, but really virtually everywhere uh, except in your own rooms, will mean masking indoors. Um, I know that's a struggle sometimes, and I know that communicating with a mask on isn't always easy but that is going to be an absolute requirement of being part of the community. Wearing a mask indoors, even if you're vaccinated, is the best way you can protect yourself and protect all of us from spreading the virus. And so that is going to be a prerequisite of any indoor activity, again, especially in classrooms, laboratories, uh, other, other moments. Uh, and faculty will be asking you if they see your mask slip below your nose to pull it up, it gets up, pull it down. Uh, because we're asking people to wear masks indoors, we are also asking students and faculty not to engage in extensive eating or drinking during class. Um, obviously, if you need to take a short sip from a water bottle, you can do so underneath a mask. But really, we're asking students to refrain from that during classroom, uh, classroom time. Uh, again, I realize that's an imposition and a limitation, but we feel that's necessary in order to keep the airborne transmission to a minimum during the classroom. The other thing to really put, and I'll talk at a high level now, we can maybe get more specifics later, is your faculty will understand that there will be students who will need to quarantine during the course of the semester uh, because of COVID. That's something they're prepared for. We've learned a lot in the last year about how to support students when that happened. Uh, for those of you who are not on campus, this was unfortunately things, something that occurred quite often during the, during the fall and the spring of last year. On the flip side, you should understand that your faculty may need to quarantine, um, either because uh, they, are, they um, have contracted COVID or because, and I think this is frankly much more likely, especially during the beginning of the academic year, they have children at home who have been asked to quarantine because they've been exposed to COVID. Children under the age of 13 have not been vaccinated. We have many faculty and other staff working at the university who have children in the, in the schools. And those children all of a sudden are often getting sent home for a week, sometimes a little bit more. Um, and, and a parent who didn't really have any other childcare lined up is finding themselves in the back in the position of homeschooling. When that happens, you may find yourself meeting on Zoom for a week or a week and a half. That's part of the flexibility that we're gonna to have to have with each other over the course of the academic year. Luckily, we have a lot more experience now um, uh, in, in converting to that environment and then coming back in person again. So that's the large frame of what we're expecting uh, in the semester. We can talk more about specifics as we go along. 
Um, like everybody, we are excited to be back on campus. We're a little bit anxious about it. And we're gonna be learning some new things along the way. And as Dean Galai said, we're gonna do this all together. And you're, um, you're gonna play a part in that uh, as well as your faculty, your, the great staff who are on this call and us as administrators. And with that, you know, one of the, the people that I've learned a lot from and been going through all this together over the last year has been Amir St. Clair, um, the Associate Vice President for COVID-19 Response and the person who really brings together all of our health and safety measures as we think about how to work through this as a community. So let me hand it over to, uh, to Amir. Great, thank you, Dean Elliott. And uh, good evening, everyone. Let me uh, echo my thanks to all the, the student leaders and the campus leaders who have helped put on this important forum. And also let me thank all of you who are joining this call um, as it's all important for you to learn this information, but it also demonstrates your interest in being an active partner as we come back together this fall. And so just thank you for all joining and being active partners as we move forward together. Um, as uh, Dean Elliott mentioned, my role is really to help uh, coordinate uh, Emory's COVID-19 response, uh, make sure that it is informed by evidence and data, uh, and to help build policies and protocols to create that safe campus environment, and to make sure we're prepared uh, for any types of uh, adjustments or modifications necessary as we move through the academic year. Let me quickly talk about um, kind of three important areas. The first is, uh, what is the ecosystem or the infrastructure that Emory has created to support everyone coming back for the fall? Um, how have those protocols and policies and that infrastructure been created and what has helped inform that decision-making? And then also, how are we prepared for any changes that might occur? What are our contingency plans and what might that look like? And so let me talk a little bit about that. The first is, let me echo how excited we are to welcome everybody back. This has been months and months and months of preparations to put us in a position where we can support the health and safety environment by living, working, and studying in person together. And we've done that by creating a really robust and extensive infrastructure built upon layered mitigation strategies. And the most crucial of that layered mitigation strategies is around vaccinations. As many of you know, Emory has required vaccinations for all students faculty and staff members for the fall semester. This is critical because as we know, vaccines are safe, effective, and the most important tool to limit infection, limit transmission, and decrease the chance of severe illness, hospitalization, or death. And that's a critical mitigation layer that forms the, the foundation for our response. But we've also layered an additional uh, mitigation uh, platform on top of vaccinations is we require testing for all those who are unvaccinated. And we require testing so that everybody is contributing to the health and safety of the campus community, where we can say every student, faculty, and staff member is either vaccinated or they're testing regularly. And testing is important because it helps us identify transmission risk, helps us identify prevalence, and we can remove those who are infected and provide them the level of care that they need and make sure that transmission can be reduced. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So vaccinations and testing are critical, but we also have robust mitigation strategies underneath that. Emory has a wonderful contact tracing process to make sure we can identify those who might be close contacts and provide them the level of care that they need. We provide quarantine and isolation space for our students living on campus to make sure that they can provide or be provided that level of care that they need and make sure that we can continue some of the services in terms of academic continuity and other types of support systems that they may need. We also have enhanced cleaning protocols. Um, we've looked at air filtration systems in the classrooms and in our academic spaces. We've looked at how our, our shuttles are retrofitted with cleaning protocols. We've created a whole infrastructure and the teams behind them necessary to make sure that everybody is in a safe and healthy environment so that we can live, work, and study together. Now, how have we gone about creating that infrastructure? Well, since the beginning of the pandemic, Emory has launched and has use a working multidisciplinary teams to help direct and make decisions around COVID-19 response efforts. That decision-making process and those teams are primarily led and informed by public health guidance, by evidence, and by data. We have robust public health guidance agencies across the U.S., here in Georgia, and within the metro Atlanta area that helps inform what is the current conditions of COVID-19. How can we assess that against what we're seeing in the community, but also what does it mean for Emory? And so we use that evidence and data to help inform our decision-making so that they're always rooted in the evidence and the data. And at Emory, as many of you know, we are incredibly lucky that we have amazing public health experts right here at Emory who are involved in the process and thinking through and helping us better understand 
what is the evidence and the data and how can we make sure we make good decisions for our community based on that. So all the policies, the procedures and the protocols that are in place go through an extensive vetting process that is informed by public health guidance and is really using the expertise available to us here at Emory. And then the last is how are we prepared for contingencies? How are we prepared for shifts in the environment? And the first thing I would say is that everything Emory has done up to this date, all the protocols, all the procedures, everything that you're going to experience as you come back to campus has been done so that we can be in a position to be able to respond effectively. It's been done so that we can come back together and live and work and study in a safe environment. Um, so all of those are really important because they've also been built with variants in mind, with changes in the ecosystem to position us so that we can be flexible. And as Dean Elliott said, we've learned so much over these past 18 months to better position us to respond to change. Think about back in March 2020 when Emory, like other institutions, had to move to fully remote. We knew very little at that time about the pandemic. We had no testing services available to us. We didn't have contact tracing available. We didn't have quarantine and isolation space. And we most certainly didn't have the vaccinations. We have that now. And that positions us to be able to respond effectively if there needs to be a contingency in the future. And if there is, we're prepared to do that. We're consistently looking at public health data every single day. Our leadership teams and our public health advisory teams are reviewing this data regularly not just what we're seeing across the country, but more specifically within our area and our, our ecosystem here at Emory, and that we are positioned to be able to make changes as necessary, increase our testing frequency, be able to think about physical distancing requirements or think about gatherings. But we are really committed to say that we wanna live, work and study together in person. And we may make modifications to be able to do that in a safe and healthy way. The last thing I'll say is all of this is really contingent on our partnership model. Having policies and protocols and tests and vaccinations and contact tracing are great, but they're not effective if they're not used, if they're not uh, in partnership with our students, our faculty and staff. Everyone plays a role. And in order for our policies and our protocols to be effective, everyone needs to contribute and be participative in that process. So partnership is key and it's reliant on all of us pulling our way together to do that. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about some of these procedures as we move forward. But I do want to make sure that I can introduce um, our next guest, who is the chief of our Emory Public, um, our police department, Chief Cheryl Elliott. Thank you, Amir. Uh, it's appreciated. And uh, sorry about the, about the technical. Um, so I want to echo what you've heard from everyone else. Um, I came to Emory, returned to Emory community in May. And um, I realized this week just how, just how much I've missed the anticipation and the engagement that um, each of the new academic years bring, uh, having spent almost 28, uh, 28 years of academic years here. For the police department, the challenges look very different. We, we are, as essential employees, been here throughout the pandemic. Uh, we have, have not left the campus. Uh, the officers in this community have uh, done their job keeping things safe and, and are uh, anxious and, uh, to have you back on, uh, in the campus environment. Um, we're, we're committed this year to redefining what it means to serve and protect in, in a higher education environment. Uh, we intend to collaborate with the Emory community we serve. And, and for me, um, and, and, and the officers that serve with me, that is our most important mission. Um, in the past, uh, one of my most memorable uh, opportunities was perhaps just to let you know a little uh, about where we are coming from and how we intend to be engaged uh, was the formation of the Emory Women's Center. Uh, as I participated in that uh, event that came out of the uh, women's group on, at Emory. Uh, some other great partnerships we've had over the years were working with student-sponsored charities, supporting uh, nonprofits that are in our community, uh, and, uh, and also to make certain that officers are present in those spaces. Uh, we're going to support a safe environment as you conduct student-sponsored concerts, 
public events and other activities um, that are going on, on on the campus. We're gonna continue to work with community, to collaborate and identify opportunities for engagement. Uh, I wanna thank you all for uh, your time today. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Akash. Perfect. Um, thank you all for your opening remarks. Uh, we're going to move on to the question and answer session uh, section of the session. So we're going to start with questions about health and safety in the Delta variant, which we've been getting a lot of questions about. Um, so first, the biggest question we've gotten from students is, what will happen if there's a COVID surge again on campus? Is there a possibility of students being sent home again? Yeah, Akash, and I can uh, start, you know, to answer that question. So this is, a, you know, an important question, and we know that this is coming across a lot. As we take a look at the ecosystem around us, we're obviously very aware of, you know, the Delta variant and certainly other variants that are at play. And so what will Emory do, you know, if we see cases rise among our community, if there's a surge, if there's an outbreak, how will we respond? And again, the first thing I will say is that in many ways, all of the protocols and procedures that we put in place are to help us limit surges and outbreaks and spread. And so why I talk about this partnership is our ability to manage surges and spreads before we even get to that point is really dependent on all of us playing that role. Why we have a high vaccination rate of 90% across our campus community, why we still require masks, why we still have robust testing is to help us mitigate and manage the potential for surges. But we're also prepared that that could happen. And so how are we going to um, move forward in that event? The first thing I will say is Emory has dealt with surges in the past. Um, we have had surges and outbreaks, um, you know, uh, this past year, and that's been important for us in terms of learning how to manage that appropriately. How can we take the appropriate mitigation strategies when we see a surge or an outbreak? And again, a lot of that's dependent on the public health guidance and what we see from evidence and data in terms of where is that risk? Where is transmission occurring? Where is that outbreak? Emory has contact tracing teams and cluster investigation teams who are trained to be able to identify what does that surge look like? Where is the risk and how do we go about um, responding to that? And so we've learned and we've implemented from those, um, those learning lessons to be able to help us manage that. It may require additional testing, increasing the frequency of our testing. It might require us to think about some types of um, gathering restrictions or limitations. It might require us to think about how do we implement different types of protocols depending on where that surge or outbreak occurred. Um, and so what I would always say is, it depends on what we're seeing in terms of the evidence. The evidence and data will tell us how we need to respond appropriately to make sure we are mitigating that surge. And we have ways that we can interrupt transmission, not only through testing, but removing infected individuals from population, putting them into quarantine and isolation and being able to manage that very quickly. Again, we've gone through this before. We've learned how to manage this. We, and we did that before vaccinations, you know, or even um, um, within our community. And so we'll take those lessons learned and apply them in the future, uh, should we see a surge or an outbreak among our campus community. Amir, can I just also add, uh, one of the questions that we talked about leading up to this forum is th the idea of restarting the fall semester. And at least for some of the folks on the call, the perception could be tomorrow, we're inviting back, you know, hundreds of people all at once. And I really wanted to reemphasize because we've had this conversation with some students even on this call is that we have been in an 18 month uh, learning process and uh, iter iterative process of learning. And there have there has been a population of students or staff or faculty on our campus throughout this 18 months. And in, in terms of students coming back to campus, uh, some of our professional schools and other parts of the community started that return back in July. So we we are not we are not new to the return of students, and we we are also not new to having folks on campus, at least even with the Delta variant. And so it's important for you to know when you're coming back to campus, it's been a slow buildup of a population. And in that buildup, we've also just understood and un know a lot more about how to take care, take care of the community. And um, as it relates to the variables, it's really important too, and that we, you know that we're also thinking not just a, about a COVID-19 response, but we're also thinking about what this means for your academic experience, what this means for your residential experience, but also your mental health. 
And um, part of that is really doubling down and strengthening our ability to get you those resources consistently because although we can manage surges and we've demonstrated capacity to manage surges in the past, we know that that has an impact on your sense of uh, well-being, on anxiety, your, your, your perception of your environment. And it's also important that you know we understand that and there are resources, there will be resources readily available to you to also think through what that means as the semester proceeds. That's great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what will be the masking guidelines on campus and what will be the consequences if the guidelines are not followed? Sure, so uh, again, I can you know start to answer that and Dean Elliott talked a little bit about already what our masking uh, policies and procedures are as we head into the fall. Um, Emory has kept its, its masking policy uh, pretty um, in line with uh, CDC guidelines, even uh, when there is some lifting of restrictions, we continue to keep our masking policy in place, uh, largely because it's a layered mitigation strategy that we're trying to use on top of all of these other mitigation strategies. And so we always think about masks, not just as its own critical tool, but it needs to be in collaboration and integrated with all these other mitigation strategies that we have in place. So that's why masking has been so important in our strategy. At this time, Masks are not required when you are in an outdoor setting. If you're outdoors on campus, masks are not required. However, if you're unvaccinated, you're strongly advised to wear masks because you cannot maintain physical distancing. This is in line with CDC and public health guidance. In indoor settings, masks are required regardless of your vaccination status. So masks are required if you're in the classrooms, if you're in common or public spaces, if you're riding our shuttles, if you're in a meeting room, masks are required in indoor settings um, regardless of vaccination status. There are some exemptions. If you are actively eating, drinking, as Dean Elliott said, um, if you are in a private, enclosed, single occupancy space, so if you are in a private office, if you're in a private study room, or if you're in your personal living space. Um, however, and I wanna always make sure we note that there may be some spaces on campus that have more restrictive measures, more restrictive protocols in place, depending on that space and the function of activities in that space. So those are the guidelines as it relates to masking. And again, masking is so critical, not just because it itself is an important tool, because it has to be in partnership with everything else that we've put together. And that's why we stress it so much. In terms of what are the, 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 the consequences or what are the expectations and how are they gonna be held accountable? The first thing I would share is Emory still has a community compact among its students. So if you recall last year, Emory put together a community compact that outlines behavioral expectations and standards that we expect and will hold our community to. And there is one for students. Um, it's up on Emory Forward. Uh, you can go ahead and review it. And basically it outlines what we are holding you accountable to and what you should expect if you're a student here at Emory University. And so that does outline masking um, protocols and masking um, uh, your responsibility to mask. And it does outline what happens if you're not being responsible and accountable. And there are student conduct measures in place to hold our students responsible for being good partners. Um, so there are measures in place to hold people accountable. We also hope that everybody here holds each other accountable, right? We've learned that the most important way that we can hold each other accountable is through our peers, is through each other. This is a public health crisis that requires a public health response. And so we all need to be part of um, this community and all holding each other accountable. Perfect. Um, another question we've gotten a lot from students is, the protocol for unvaccinated students. And so can you talk about like what happens if a student chooses not to get the vaccine if they come onto campus? And another like subset of that question is, what is the protocol for students who have received one dose and are planning to get the second dose after school starts? Yeah, it's a good question, Akash. I might welcome uh, Dr. Sharon Rabinovitz, um, the director of our student health services to help answer that question. Thank you, Amir. So we, we are getting this question a lot and I'm happy to go through it. So for those students who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, they will engage in the same testing protocol at this time. Upon arrival, they will test as soon as they are able to, which has to be within 48 hours of arrival. And we are also asking students to test five days after they arrive um, for extra measure of safety. That will then start the weekly cadence of testing for all those who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. Um, 
our, a lot of people have worked very hard on making the testing locations very accessible. We have testing locations at Emory Conference Center Hotel, the Student Center, the Student Academic and um, Activity Center on the Claremont campus, and all their um, hours and locations are on the Emory Forward in a wonderful table, so I recommend that you look there. So especially over the weekend for move-in, they will be accessible all weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Um, student health will also be offering vaccinations for those of you who have not been able to access vaccinations or need to finish the series. We will be on site at the, um, the AMUC, which is the um, uh, building right across from the Emory Student Center. Um, if, you, if it's facing across the courtyard, you'll be able to access that. We will have COVID vaccines. I will put in the chat the access for signing up for COVID vaccines, as well as other routinely required vaccines will also be available on a walk-in basis. If you need a COVID vaccine, we highly recommend that you do sign up, however, and I'll put that in the chat as well. When you're fully vaccinated, which is two weeks after your final dose, you will not need to test any further. So that is the goal for everyone. Great. Um, as we know, students had single rooms or single dorm rooms last year. What is the protocol if you or your roommate gets COVID if you live on campus in a dorm with a roommate? I can take that one as well. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask Sharon <laughs> to weigh in. Sharon, before you start, as it relates to the previous question about vaccination rate, too, it's important to put point people to the uh, Emory Forward page and the COVID-19 dashboard, which is a real-time accounting of what percentage of our community has been vaccinated. So you can go there anytime and see percentages for faculty, staff, and students. And it's important that you keep track of it because I know it's a, we get that question a lot. I want you to know we've worked hard to make sure that data is available to everyone in the community. Thank you, Dean Goliath. And I did put that, I have that up on, on, my, on my computer at all times, actually. So I just put that on in the chat for everyone. So for a student who is, um, her, their roommate is COVID positive, this, the roommate, um, their experience is dependent on their vaccination status. The person who is positive will be going, if they are living on campus, they will be going to the hotel for isolation for 10 days. That, that part has not changed. For students who are the roommate, if they are vaccinated, they will be a close contact. They will be contacted by contact tracing. Um, the difference is they will not have to quarantine at the hotel. There are some caveats. They can do pretty much anything that they would expect to do, going to classes um, and being with their friends. But the caveats are they must wear a mask. They must, um, make sure that they are, if they're around high risk individuals that they keep their distance. They will have to test on day five um, and they will be followed by contact tracing. They will get a survey of their symptoms on day seven and day 14. So they will be followed for, for 14 days to make sure they don't develop symptoms. So that's very important. If someone is unvaccinated, then it's very similar to the process that occurred last year. They will be in quarantine. They will be contacted by contact tracing and student health to follow them. Um, they will be there for 10 days at this point. We continually reassess the data to ensure that we are following the appropriate protocols. Um, but at this time, it is 10 days. They will get a test um, upon entry. They will get a test on day eight and they will exit quarantine on day 11. And important to reiterate, the conference center hotel remains the uh, quarantine isolation site for the university. And it remains to be a holistic support system for students in quarantine and isolation. Everything from dining, which a lot of people are responsible on this call, um, rec and wellness to make sure that people have time outside. Um, counseling and psychological services, office of spiritual and religious life, obviously a lot of medical support. And that's just naming a few of the pieces of that um, support system that will follow people in isolation and quarantine. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for your answer. Um, we're gonna move on to academic environment questions, but as COVID is still very prevalent. A lot of these questions have to do with COVID as well. So I'll be running theme throughout our questions. Um, 
Uh, Dean Elliott, you briefly touched on this in your opening remarks, but how will students, we've gotten a lot of questions on how will students keep up with their classes if they get COVID and how will professors hold class if they get COVID? Great, great question. So um, on the latter piece, on uh, the first piece, un you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, we have a lot of experience with this um, question from last year. We are continuing to encourage faculty to record classes via Zoom. That will obviously work better in some classes than others. The more lecture style classes um, work better for recording. A discussion style class is much harder to, to record and make available. And in those kinds of classes, we're going to have to rely on the traditional forms of support that we used for ill students long before the pandemic. Um, uh, the pandemic is not the first time that students have had to miss class for extended periods because of, uh, because of an illness. Um, again, fortunately or unfortunately, last year, we uh, were um, forced to refine our, our, you know, our support systems. Um, we really do work very closely with the students who are in quarantine and making sure that they can take up with their, uh, to, they can keep up with their classes. In some cases, um, we have the team in place to help ask for ac academic accommodations, including extensions of deadlines, um, other kinds of uh, accommodations if those proves necessary. I suspect in most cases they will not, but there will be probably some cases, cases where they will. I mean, I, and I think the thing you have to also just realize is that faculty understand this is um, going to be unfortunately part of some students' experience. And I think a key thing is, and I'm happy to say this under recording, your faculty would much rather have you miss a class if you fear you have a symptom than come to class, right? If, if you think you might be experiencing the onset of, of COVID, they would rather have you stay away. Um, and that, I know that's sometimes hard because you're worried about missing something, something important, but they do understand and um, they would much rather that. I think we all would. Um, on the flip side, you know, what happens when faculty get COVID, which will also likely occur. Um, a, a lot depends on what that means. Does that mean the faculty member actually gets, gets ill? Um, or, you know, many people, most people, in fact, who are vaccinated, as most of our faculty are, who contract COVID are not experiencing anything more than much mild symptoms. If it, the symptoms are mild, faculty will probably teach their class on Zoom. Uh, and so you may find yourself, even though you've been meeting in a lecture hall or uh, a discussion table, find yourself on Zoom for a week or two in that, in that case. Again, I mentioned the possibility that sometimes might be, be because a family member has contracted COVID. Uh, and again, if in the cases where a faculty is ill, um, we have uh, actually a system in place in most cases where there's a backup faculty person to cover a week of class or you may find yourself missing, missing a particular class or, or having something rescheduled as you would in any other semester. So we're gonna to have to be flexible with each other as we continue to navigate this environment. Okay, great. Um, so will there be any social distancing or COVID protection measures within the classrooms or lecture halls? That, that's a great question. And there was a, also a question about the library that I'll fold into this. That, um, uh, the answer is we are not social distancing at this at this time, um, and so we are back to full seating in the classroom. Um, there, in some classrooms, there may be specific spaces that are off off limits to you uh, because the faculty member or somebody who's looking at the space has decided that um, that those pose a greater risk than usual. But we'll be back to normal seating uh, in most activities. I saw a similar question about the library um, and the library, all floors are open and we are back to regular seating patterns there as well. Um, but again, you may find some very particular spaces um, are restricted in terms of seating. Uh, Amir, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. You've yeah, I was just gonna uh, quickly brief, you know, kind of what, what's the, uh, the rationale behind it? How is this informed in terms of policies and, and protocols? And ultimately this very much aligns with current CDC um, ACHA guidance in terms of if you have a largely vaccinated community, again, which Emory is, where we're going to be north of 90% vaccinations and where everybody in the classroom we know is going to be vaccinated or testing regularly, right? So it's a really important point that we know that 90% at least will be vaccinated. Anyone else is going to be tested. Anyone who is symptomatic is not coming into the classrooms. 
um, that we're removing infected individuals and putting them in quarantine and isolation, and we're requiring masks in indoor settings, um, that density requirements can be removed in those types of environments. And so very much the policies and protocols of removing uh, physical distancing in certain spaces and functions are largely informed by the evidence and data and public health guidance to be able to do so. Doesn't mean that conditions might not change, we may have to adjust, but ultimately that protocol aligns with what we've been able to see from evidence uh, projected by our public health. Okay, perfect. Um, we're gonna move on to questions about housing, dining, residential visitor policy and shuttles. Um, I'd like to remind everyone, if you have questions, the Q&A feature is popping off, like administration there answering questions, so feel free to use that as well. Um, the first question in this section is, what is the visitor policy for residence halls this year? I'm gonna ask Scott to join us to answer the question. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Scott Roush. I'm the Senior Director for Residence Life in uh, the Office of Story and Maternity Life. Um, our visitation policy is that all Emory students, residential students must, uh, if they have a guest, that guest must be accompanied by uh, the student who is uh, a resident of that, that space. And we will return back to that uh, policy in the fall. Um, also, one of the things that, that changed with COVID was that we allow residential students access to all uh, lobby spaces of all residential facilities, and that will return back um, to, uh, to normal uh, when, when students return. Uh, students are already here, but when students primarily return uh, over the weekend. Um, we don't. We do not uh, restrict visitors into the buildings. The, the deviation for that for this academic year is that we are still not requiring. We are still requiring that off-campus, non-affiliated Emory uh, folks um, not be allowed into the residential facilities. Uh, just because the idea around vaccinations and the testing protocol is really to protect our off and off-campus students. And we don't know who those folks who are outside the Emory environment, um, what they're participating in. So um, uh, that's, that's sort of the, the crux of it. Um, and our hope is to return back to sort of one of us, some, a somewhat normal residential uh, experience. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, will the DCT and Cox Hall be operating at full capacity this year? And what will their hours be? So that question's come up several times in the chat. We've already answered it in the chat. Um, so yes, returning to full operation. I'll let Dave Furman uh, give you the details on hours, but yes, the it, those spaces will be open and returning to full operation. Hey, thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Furman. I'm Senior Director of Operations uh, for Campus Life, and uh, that includes campus dining. Uh, yes, all of our dining locations will return to full hours, full service, and full operations, and full density. Um, we're thrilled. We're excited and thrilled to welcome our students back um, to all of our locations. We will have dining service at all locations. The DCT will go back to its regular hours of 7.30 a.m., until 10 p.m. with continuous service on Monday through Thursday and uh, 7.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Fridays and 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturdays and 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Sundays. Um, and uh, Cox will go back to its regular hours as well um, and will be open till um, 9 p.m. during the week and will be open from 11 to 3 on weekends. So, um, oh, sorry, regarding, do you want to add it? Uh, I was going to say, what about uh, Caldi's and Starbucks and some of those other favorite, yep. favorite spots? Caldi's, Starbucks, all locations will be open. We will have um, some abbreviated hours at some locations. For instance, at Starbucks, we'll be um, closing on weekends at 3 p.m. Um, for a, a few different reasons. Um, one of them is um, we're experiencing, like many places around the United States, um, a challenge with, um, with staffing. Um, but we are working real hard to make sure that we mitigate any of the, um, you know, any, any of the uh, problems or experiences um, with staffing to make sure that uh, we provide the full student experience. So Caldi's will be open until um, 10 p.m. Um, during the week, open till midnight on weekends, 
um, and will be open in the student center until uh, 10 p.m. Thank you, Dave. Perfect. Um, regarding residence halls, uh, Scott, you touched on this earlier, but um, specific, what specific COVID protection and cleaning measures we put in place to stop spread in residence halls and communal bathrooms specifically as well? Um, yeah, well, in terms of cleaning, uh, building residential services, which is our uh, the sort of uh, custodial arm of camp services, will be in the building seven days a week. Um, they have a specific cleaning schedule. That cleaning schedule was developed over the, co the course of the previous part of COVID. So from March of 2020 um, till now, we have been engaged in that cleaning with, with students in the building. Um, it's hard to say the number of things because it really does depend on student motion. And so, for example, you know, they might have on their slate to clean it four times before noon, but because of showers and students using the restroom facilities, that may get kicked to later, but ultimately they will be there and they will be cleaning and wiping down um, sort of the common spaces and high touch spaces like the restroom or some of the open lounges um, on, on a very regular basis. I will say, you know, it doesn't also hurt if students want to also wipe down those spaces uh, on their own as they're engaging in them. Um, it's also a, a much um it's helpful for us uh but but building residential services has a plan they've been using that plan through all covid um and they will be in the buildings and make sure that they are clean and safe for students okay great um and this is a question we've seen pop up in the q a a few times but will there be a takeout option for the dct dave Furman has answered that a couple of times in the chat the takeout option is in Cox and other eateries, but I'll, I'll let him um, give you more of those details. Yeah, we um, the DCT will revert back to um, its original format, and that is eat in only. Um, as as you all know, um, part of um, what um, you know, one of the huge objectives is in as we designed and built the, the student center and and the DCT specifically was to create a center of community. Um, and uh, the DCT, we are so excited once again. Um, to serve as, as one of the key centers of our community for our students. And so the DCT will revert back to dine-in service only, um, but we will have every other uh, dining location offering takeout service, um, as well as meal exchange. And so students can also use meal swipes at um, the Emporium with an expanded menu there at Woodruff Residential and also at the SAC. Um, and so there are some additional options there, but all other locations um, will offer takeout as they always did. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, will we, so there's a question which has come up in the Q&A a lot. Uh, will we know if our roommate and our suite mates are vaccinated or people on our dorm floor or even like other students on campus? I'm gonna let Sharon answer that as our resident doctor. <laughs> Data FERPA, um, which is um, privacy laws that oversee um, educational institutions, we are not allowed to share that information. Um, we will not share that with the housing or other divisions, and we will not share it with other in individuals. So if a student chooses to share that with their roommate, that is definitely their, their option to do so, but they will not be finding it out from any of the information that we have on record at Student Health. It is private and contained. Okay, great. Um, the next, next few questions will be about clubs and programming. So what are the limits to programming this upcoming year? Um, and is there a maximum number of people allowed at these events? Um, so all of that is really based on the uh, gathering and other policies. And remember, currently we don't have restrictions on gathering policy or social distancing. So I think what's really important to connect almost all of the questions we're asking are tied to the policies and procedures that are on the Emory Forward page. And it's, it's why it's important to stay connected to that page because that essentially will help us understand, is there a gathering policy that limits the number of people who can gather currently? No, there isn't. Um, it, are there social distancing requirements currently? No, there isn't. And so 
I, before I turn it over to Lisa, who can talk a little bit more about programming, student programming, I just wanted to really emphasize that uh, the information in real time is always av available on Emory Forward, and we've done our best to try to make that page as readable as possible, and always welcome your feedback on ways to improve it. But um, it's a really, really important source of information, especially when you can't get to an administrator to answer your um, question right away. So I'll let Lisa also weigh in. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Lisa Lovell. I'm the Director for Student Involvement, Leadership and Transitions. Mm -hmm. And like uh, Dean Galai has stated, um, most of, uh, of all of our practices for student organizations or student uh, sponsored programs and gatherings, all of those are going to be drawn from the Emory Forward. Uh, so we always ask students and student organizations and, and leadership within those organizations to draw from, from the gathering policy. But at this time, um, there are no restrictions, um, and we just ask that everyone still continues to do their part uh, in, in masking when inside uh, and, 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 and um, following all the COVID guidelines provided by the university. Um, the, okay, uh, I guess question related to intramural and club sports. So how will they operate this year? Will it go back to normal operations? Yes, and I'll, I'll let April talk about the details there because that's a really, it's a specific community and I want to make sure you're getting all the good information. Uh, April, I think you're muted. You, you think I know how to do this by now. Um, clubs and intramurals as of right now will return to what we would probably consider normal operations with some considerations. Um, any indoor activities will follow the masking guidelines just as our recreation centers do and our gyms do. That question popped up earlier in the chat that I answered, even during activity masks are required indoors. So other than that, there may be some capacity limits. Um, roster limits do some of that, but from an activity standpoint, we are trying to get back to as normal as possible because it is a large part of our those communities and, and a large part of our student experience. We'll see how it goes. And if we have to make adjustments and be flexible as we go, that's what we'll do. But our intent is to get back to playing um, and, and provide that student experience. Okay, great. Um, so that wraps up all of the questions that we had for the Q&A portion. Thank you to all of you for answering our questions. Now we'll hear from Heather Mann regarding returning student programs. Thank you so much and good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Mann and I'm the Associate Director of Returning Student Programs and I am so excited to welcome you all to campus for this upcoming school year. I and so many of my colleagues have had so much fun creating many, many events and opportunities that you just won't want to miss. And fortunately, right now, the weather seems to be on our side, too. So first, sophomores, we all know that last year was not the start to college that everyone wanted for you. With that in mind, we really want to make sure that your year gets off to a special start and really focuses on continuing to build the community that you already started building here at Emory. Starting on Sunday, after move-in, we'll have three full days of exclusive sophomore events that are a mix of traditions you missed in, last, in person last year and also brand new events created just for sophomores in mind. So Sunday night after move-in, get excited because we're going to start you off with Pops with the President in beautiful low water, and then we'll all cool off by jumping in the Claremont pool and our SYE welcome event, a dive-in movie and pool party, watching the Pixar Disney movie Soul. Monday is all about traditions, so starting the afternoon with the iconic Coke Toast, and then you'll run around campus collecting swag, solving clues, and competing for our top prizes at the Eagle Eye Spy Scavenger Hunt. Uh, Monday night is really all about enjoying the favorite traditions of Wreck the Night with your fellow sophomores. And Tuesday is the day before classes start, so be sure to check out all the lineup of open houses and fairs going on during the Wise Heart Seeks campus. Later that night, you'll close out the evening with the most iconic place on campus, the Emory Quad, with a cookout, photo booth, DJ, and all of those new friends that you met along the lines this weekend. 
Um, so juniors and seniors, we'd also love to invite you to prepare for the semester on Tuesday with the Wise Heart Seeks campus. Um, later that night, you'll have the largest event ever on Claremont campus called the Claremont Carnival. So you've got rides, games, prizes, food, swags, and we'll see you there from five to eight. And that's really just before classes start. So for the next six weeks, you can expect tons of dedicated programming for all of Emory's undergraduate students during our weeks of welcome or hashtag Emory Wow. Uh, from seniors last first day photo shoot to song fest watch party to enhanced sporting events and weekends full of new duly after dark events, campus is truly going to be the place you want to be. And you can find all those details at thehub.emory.edu. And we really, truly cannot wait for you to be here. We're going to learn together. We're going to keep each other safe. We're going to build a community at a place that only Emory can. And so I just want to thank you for being part of our community. And I just truly cannot wait to see you soon. So come out and we'll see you right before um, classes start at all of our events. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you. That about wraps up our event. Thank you to everyone that attended this event today. Please reach out to us to College Council via our email or on social media, eCollege Council, if you have any questions. All of the administrators here today are always open throughout the year to answer any questions as well. And we're happy to redirect any questions to them to make sure you have the answers you need. So thank you very much and we'll see you all soon.